morning, brother Kurt. How are you doing? You're on mute. Uh, good, brother Christopher. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Just trying to stay on top of technical issues here. Uh, I got like, some may see my split personality there as another guest. Um, I had dial in on my phone so I could actually talk and hear, and I'm using the computer for the uh, video. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to sit here. Either I wouldn't be able to talk or I wouldn't be able to hear anything. So there's all kinds of issues this morning, Up, updating drivers and breaking other things. It's such fun. <laughs> well, and I haven't heard from... This is the uh, Library of Alexandria. Oh. Because cause, um, in a previous meeting, uh, Brian Croto, who's our district deputy, um, had his library. His is an actual library. He bragged the other day he finally got his 1,000th book. And the fact that he actually knows how many he has, they're all cataloged. But he had, it looked like a fake background, but that was actually the wall behind him. That was all his books. And they had the little white stickers on them. So I said, well, I got to top that. So I had to go find an artist conception of the Library of Alexandria to say I've got a better library than he does. <laughs> so that's it and the let's see the uh the illuminati files are up here <laughs> secrets to the universe are here so yeah hopefully this one won't burn down i was going to say our um our speaker today has not turned up yet that would be bob ozell we got somebody dialing in. That may be him. Hello, one four six nine or two. How are you this morning? <laughs> you want to unmute? That'll be a good idea. Yes. Uh, if you hit the little three dots next to your picture, you can uh, rename yourself. <clears throat> okay. Oh yeah. And there you are. See, I knew if I talked about you, you'd show up. This is uh, Brother Bob. Uh, is it Uzel or Uzel? Uzzle. Uzzle. Uzzle? Huh? Correct. Like muzzle without the M? Hey, all that's right. it. All right. Brother Bob. I've always, Uzzle. that's the first time I've heard that <laughs> used. I've always said, <laughs> I've always said it rhymes with puzzle. Oh, that works too, but yeah. Either muzzle. way. Well, if I have to, if I have to muzzle Uzzle, then I'm, I can. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so good to have you with us. Um, I was just explaining we don't have, uh, we never know how many we're going to get at these at these things. Typically, we get at least 10 to 12. Um, when I signed on and no one came on for at least 10 minutes, I had a feeling we're, we're going to be uh, not going to have as big a crowd as I had hoped. But but this will be on YouTube and other people get to watch it later. So oh, it's yeah. all good. I, I do my best to have a good crowd for the uh, speaker. <laughs> I know that's pretty hard to do sometimes. Well, I, I'm never sure if, uh, Brian, what do you think? Do you think that uh, when we did it weekly, uh, we had pretty good attendance? I don't know yet if doing it every other week has, has helped with attendance or just people are busy doing other things now that lodges are back to work. What do you think? Are we? I think all the above. Plus, uh, as it's once every fortnight, it, you do have a tendency to forget. Yeah, that's what I figured. Um, I do not. Well, first of all, I don't think I could do this every Saturday. And yeah. if I had other people who consistently pitched in and we made sure we had one every Saturday and I didn't have to be here every time, that would be better. But we're not quite there yet. And um, also, I'd have to figure. Well, I mean, I could I could probably assign the. Uh, oh, I'm going to do that. I have to figure that out. Um, I'd have to assign the, the account to other people in my lodge to to manage it yeah. at all because like i tried to just add you as a host and i'd have to pay for another person on the account it's like well i'm gonna go through all that but anyway yeah, um I but yeah problem with that. when we what's that i find no problem with that whatsoever no i know 
Well, I mean, honestly, <laughs> if it came to that, if I had to buy a couple of accounts, um, I just build the lodge for it. It's only 150 yeah. a year, so it's not terrible. We could we could manage it if we needed to, but Is that um, just dollars? coming up with speakers, yeah. That's weird because it's also 150 pounds. So someone somewhere is making a wonderful little back earning. I I guess so. Yeah, the, it's the cheapest. Um, uh, uh, Zoom, for those of you who don't know, Zoom has like a free service. Anyone can go and create a Zoom account and have a meeting. And you're limited to the number of participants. I forget what it is. And you're limited to 40 minutes. And there's a, not a lot you can do, but if you had to have a meeting, anyone could go create a Zoom account and up and running, and it's super easy. I bought the cheapest tier of their paid programs. I forget what the name of it is. But it's $150 a year. I think we're 200 members, but I've never been above 60 some. And time is unlimited and I can have multiple. I get, there's all a bunch of bennies in the, the, the first paid version. And so it's worked very well for us. I'm very happy with it. I and mean, $150 is, that's about what we pay for the website. So it's pretty good. But um, I don't know, just trying, setting aside not having people, um, to host this, to take it off of me, is finding speakers every week. It, it's hard enough me lining up two speakers a month. It just seems like I, I get going, I line up a few people, and then I let it go, and then I'm like, oh no, I only have one more speaker. Let me go find a few more. So I'm constantly, you know, searching for more speakers, and I try not to repeat. I'm trying to make sure I get new speakers in here. I will probably start repeating a few people, um, but it's it's kind of like it it does take a bit of time lining people up and all that that's you know if i had someone else help with that that would be good and you, you throw people my way and i talk to them and the last guy that you referred to me brian uh he said no i don't give talks i'm like oh okay well <laughs> but he does i think he does maybe just doesn't do zoom meetings i don't know but perhaps he expects but we just money. Started chatting. oh does he expect money oh, okay um, there's well, one I'm fellow who i I, I, and that might be, well, I, I'm not prepared to pay anybody to talk. I mean, what right too? what right. But um, I mean, this is just to help masonry out. Um, there's one fellow that I had been talking to, but he insists on, he records the meetings and he releases them as like, well, I'm not going to do that. Sorry. You're going to speak here. It's our platform. I record it. I make it available online. You feel free to share it. He has another guy who uh, I think it was the alchemist fella who had who was the the or the uh, observant Jew who couldn't speak on Saturday and we had to meet on like Tuesday or whatever it was um, the fellow who introduced me all he did was introduce me but he kept pinging on me and he's like well I want to make sure I get a copy so I can share it I was like uh, no you are welcome to post a link <laughs> you know you didn't do anything you just introduced me to the fellow uh, you are welcome to share our YouTube link anywhere you want. And they can go watch it on our page. I'm not going to give you a recording of it or anything. You didn't. You weren't even the speaker. It was kind of weird. But have you had? Know, uh, we haven't had that many issues. Have you had Salman Sheikh mm -hmm. as speaker? I have not. Do you know who I'm talking about? I think I, I, the name is familiar. Uh, he uh, is a good friend of mine. Uh, we have uh, been friends on Facebook for some time, and we mm -hmm. uh, he lives in Philadelphia. And he has a brother in the Dallas area, and he was up. To, he was in Dallas recently, and we had dinner together. And anyway, in fact, oh, okay. he's he's up there at Plano at this as we speak. Uh, but uh, he, uh, I've been on his blog a number of occasions. He is a he's from Pakistan, now lives in Philadelphia. Oh. He is both a Freemason okay. and a Sufi. Oh, and so uh, he's done quite a bit of research in a lot of different areas and compares Freemasonry mm -hmm. to a lot of different religious traditions, but uh, he's somebody uh, would be worthwhile to have on oh, your absolutely. show. Well, yeah, I have send him my info and I'll be happy to chat with him because okay, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm the only one doing this. So here's our truck driver. Um, I'm uh, it's kind of like, it's one of those things that you get busy on other things and then you realize like, oh wait, I have to line up some speakers. It's just, it takes a bit of work. I'm, I'm slowly building up a, a list and I imagine after a while, I'll, I'll just come back to people and say, hey, if you want to come back and speak again, you know. Uh, oh, I want to say hi to brother Ade who signed in. 
And Brother Clark, who just signed in, good to have you with us. Oh, hi, Chris, good to be back there. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, it is a little after it's 10 tenths or 12, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virginia Research Lodge's unstated meeting. This is held on behalf of Virginia Research Lodge number 1777 in Highland Springs, Virginia. I am going to post in the chat our usual links. Most of you are regulars, but just for anyone who's watching on YouTube who doesn't actually get to see these links because you're watching on YouTube, but uh, if you are watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Uh, our links here in the chat for the people who are at the meeting. The first is a link to our Facebook page. This is where we publish uh, links to meeting like this. We have events um, like this one that we highlight. We have our research papers from our archives and the other research lodges in Virginia, and we post those every week and as well as emailing them out if you want to sign up. Then our lodge website where you can find all of our papers and other interesting things I've built along the way. You can find meeting times for all of the research bodies in Virginia. There's a lot of AMD councils in there and a research chapter and all. Uh, then our YouTube channel, which is where we host, we post all of these recordings when we're done. And then finally, my email address, if you don't connect to me on Facebook, you can email me directly and get on our mailing list. Um, today's speaker is Brother Bob Puzzle, rhymes with puzzle or muzzle. He's from the Grand Lodge of Texas. I think I met him on the Texas Freemasons uh, group. I got on there and met a lot, of, a lot of people I know from elsewhere got on the Texas Freemasons Facebook group and we've been having fun. I've been sharing my papers with them and, um, you know, and it's a lot of good brothers there, a lot of good discussion going on. Oh, I did want to say one thing before I hand it over to Brother Bob and he can introduce himself and all that. I had the opportunity to speak the other day at, um, at um, where was it? I had the opportunity to speak the other day at South Norfolk Lodge in South Norfolk. And I spoke on charity. I read a paper by uh, a brother from A. Douglas Smith Lodge, a paper he gave 20 years ago. And that was pretty neat to be able to take one of those papers that we put out online. And they'd asked for a paper on charity because they're starting a new uh, charity project. Project, and it was about um, charity as reflected in the three major religions. It's called it was uh, Zedekah, I think Zabat, and charity. Very interesting, well received paper, and it was nice to read someone else's um, paper in a lodge, and so other people got a chance to hear it. So that was that was a neat experience. Um, I like giving my own talks, but if I can reread a paper written by one of our brothers from the past it's kind of neat to reshare that and give people a chance to hear it uh, i'm going to go ahead and hand it off to brother Uzzle. take it away thank you brother douglas it's certainly my pleasure to uh, be here today uh, i want to say first of all that uh, virginia is a very special state to me one of my favorite states i'm a native of texas born in waco born and raised in Waco, and I have three degrees from Baylor University, BA, MA, and PhD. I've had uh, a varied career as a pastor, a uh, teacher, a social worker, now a chaplain. I've uh, written four books, and uh, I'm a minister in, in court right now, the pastor in Corse County, Texas, of the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, but I, Virginia, I've been there a few times. I spent three months. Any of you guys know where Pulaski, Virginia is? Does anybody? Uh, you know where Roanoke is? Yeah, Pulaski is in the southwest. It's about an hour's drive from Roanoke. It's in the southwest part of the state, about 30 miles from the West Virginia line. In 1973, right before I graduated from Baylor, I was <clears throat> recruited to sell for Southwestern Company, a uh, publishing house in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And when I came to, uh, uh, I spent a week in Nashville and in sales school, and then I was informed I was going to Pulaski, Virginia. I'd never heard of the place. I had that, that job involved uh, working door-to-door -door book sales 
75 to 80 hours a week uh, on a commission basis, but it's not for everybody, but for a college student, there's a, a way to make a lot of money. And I had some lifelong contacts there from the company. And also that was 19, summer of 73. I'm hoping in the summer of 2023 to return to Pulaski uh, from the 50th anniversary. And it's a uh, uh, beautiful Appalachian community. In 1987, I attended the Phylaxis Society Convention in uh, Washington, D.C., and we got a, uh, we visited the, the House of the Temple in D.C., and also we got a bus ride across the Potomac to the George Washington National Masonic Monument in Alexandria, which was very nice. Of course, Alexandria is a long way from my beloved Pulaski. Well, at the same meeting, I had the privilege of meeting out the man. I think he may have been the founder of your lodge, Alan E. Roberts, the noted Masonic historian. Uh, I, uh, I've read his books on the Civil War and Reconstruction, and he was a good man. And the, uh, I, have, I have a sister whose uh, her first husband was in the Navy, and uh, – they were stationed at uh, Virginia Beach, and she just stayed. So they, she never left there, and she's still there. Uh, and I, when I, met, I mentioned about going to Pulaski next year, so you're going to have to come see me while you're up here, and hopefully we'll be able to do that. Um, Howard Zebulon Plummer was a very interesting man, and – uh, he was one of the most outstanding individuals to hold the leadership roles during the 20th century about on both the black Jews and the Prince Hall Freemasons. He was totally committed. To think, Bob, Bob, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, do, are, do you have a presentation or is it just going to be speaking? I've just speaking. I don't okay. have any All PowerPoints right. or anything like that. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, he was, what they call black Jews. There's a lot of different uh, groups of black Jews. And he was part of the church of God and saints and of Christ. And there is even um, a division among that about how Jesus is viewed, uh, whether as merely a, a rabbi or whether as the son of God, uh, he was, he had a more Christocentric approach to, uh, the black Jewish faith that's been de described as a combination of Judaism, Christianity, and black nationalism. But he was born November 16, 1899 in Philadelphia, the son of Bishop William Henry Plummer and Mrs. Jenny B. Plummer. He attended elementary and high school in Boston, Massachusetts, and studied at MIT. In 1945, he received the Doctor of Divinity degree, from Wilberforce University at Xenia, Ohio. And it was on April the 20th, 1917, the age of 17, he was ordained an elder in the Church of God and Saints of Christ. Uh, that church uh, is still in existence. And uh, it was founded in 1896 in Lawrence, Kansas, by Bishop William Saunders Crowdy. And um, it, you know, it was on December 28th, 1931, he was installed as rabbi of the congregation in the Belleville section of Portsmouth, Virginia. And in February of 1932, following the death of Bishop Calvin S. Skinner, he was consecrated as a bishop and installed as Grandfather Abraham and chief executive of the denomination. He held that position until his retirement in 1975. And uh, he always maintained a strong commitment to maintain the Jewish and Christian elements in the church. While observing faithfully the Seventh-day Sabbath and all the Jewish feast days, he consistently claimed Jesus as Messiah and Lord. He resisted efforts from some Jewish communities to convince him to discard Christological teachings and become more traditionally Jewish. It's my understanding 
uh, since his death, some elements of the church have actually gone in that direction. But one of Belleville's pioneers with a great community spirit, he aided in the development of the Belleville Industrial School and was a charter member of the Belleville Widows and Orphans Hall. Founder and charter member of Norfolk Polytechnic College, which is now Norfolk State University, director emeritus of the Norfolk State Foundation. And he served as president of the Interdenominational Interracial Hampton Institute Ministers Conference, holding the longest tenure of the conference, and he was a life member of the NAACP. He held many offices in masonry. He served as worship master of Lily of the Valley Lodge, number 189 in Huntersville, Virginia. He organized both the William H. Plumber Lodge, number 271, and the Belleville Chapter, number 148, of the Order of the Eastern Star. He served as Grand Master of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Virginia from 1956 to 1958. And it is my understanding that it was during his tenure as Grand Master that the Grand Lodge officially put Prince Hall in its name and became the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Virginia. I'm not sure what they were called previously, but it was... Uh, only in the 20th century that the vast majority of the Prince Hall Grand Lodges actually incorporated the name Prince Hall. Uh, I think that happened in Texas, like, uh, I believe it was in the 1950s. And I'll have to look that up. Uh, I wrote the history of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Texas, so I should have that date memorized, but I don't. Uh, anyway, and... Bishop Plummer served as Grand Master of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Virginia, the Grand High Priest of the King Cyrus Grand Chapter of the Holy Royal Archmasons of Virginia, Grand Commander of the King Baldwin Grand T Commandery, Knights Templar of Virginia, the United Supreme Council of the Ancient Accepted Scottish Rite. He was an active 33rd degree Mason, served as Deputy of the Valley of Virginia, Grand Master of Ceremonies, and Grand Minister. On September 18, 1967, he received a Merit of Honor Award for Outstanding Contribution to the Development of Youth in Virginia from the Order of the Knights of Pythagoras. And in case you haven't heard of that, the Knights of Pythagoras is the Prince Hall counterpart to the Order of Demolay. In the ancient Egyptian Arabic order of the Nobles of the Mystic Shrine of North and South America. Excuse me, Bob. Bob. We're getting a lot of glare from that, your lamp. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. I had turned it off earlier. It was just uh, reading was a little difficult, but that's all right. I, I can read it. And uh, the um, he served uh, as illustrious potentate of Arabia Temple Number 12 in Portsmouth, which I believe is still an active temple today. He was given the designation of honorary past imperial potentate. He served the shrine for many years as imperial lecturer. In 1964, he was described as the most outstanding imperial lecturer in the history of the imperial council. And noted his extensive research in the history and culture of the Arabian people, as well as the legends and background lore of the mystic shrine. During his years in this important office, he wrote numerous articles um, for the official shrine publication, The Pyramid, compiled and edited a series of lectures entitled Shrine. And um, I've committed one of those lectures to memory and delivered it on numerous occasions over the years. And he served on the revision committee, which produced the 11th edition of the Shrine Ritual, the Pillar of Society and Other Ceremonies, which was published in June of 1973. He died on February 24, 1980. Masonic ceremonies were conducted on Wednesday, February 27th at Corpru Funeral Home in Portsmouth. His funeral was held on Thursday, February 28th at the Church of God and Saints of Christ with the eulogy delivered by Bishop Jehu Crowdy, uh, who was obviously a descendant of the founder of the church. 
uh, burial took place in Belleville National Cemetery. During the 1980 communication of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Virginia, uh, the Deputy Grandmaster Robert E. Harris gave a resolution, whereas the Grand Architect of the Universe has seen fit to call from this transitory existence our beloved brother, H.Z. Plummer, a past Grand Master of the Jurisdiction. Whereas the passing of this brother has deprived the world of one of our more prolific Masonic minds, Whereas he displayed while among us those ideals of devotion and dedication, therefore be it resolved that we bow in humble prayer for this soul may be received in the celestial mansion in the sky. Resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread upon the minutes of the Grand Lodge and a copy be sent to the family of our past Grand Master. He was moved by Robert E. Harris seconded by Clarence King and Robert Richard Evans, that the resolution be received and spread open upon the minutes of the Grand Lodge, a copy sent to the Blummer family. The motion prevailed. The craft then stood in a moment for silent prayer. Plummer was succeeded by his son, Bishop Levi Solomon Plummer, who was also a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason, and Shriner, who had tipped, uh, attempted, uh, assisted him in administrative capacity since 1953. The latter individual continues to direct the spiritual and temporal affairs of the Church of God and Saints in Christ, at least he was doing so in 2000 when I wrote this article, talk about a 20-year-old paper. Uh, Bishop Howard Zebulon Plummer was truly a credit to Black Judaism, to Christianity, to Prince Hall, Freemasonry, and uh, to the human race. During his 80 years, he made so many positive contributions to so many worthwhile causes. And today, uh, he's been gone 42 years. We should all be challenged to build on the firm foundation uh, which he laid. Uh, so... That's my uh, story of the uh, life of uh, Bishop Plummer. Thank you, Brother Uzzle. I, I really enjoyed that. That was the interesting things there. I, I didn't realize he was involved in setting up Norfolk State. That's a very, uh, very well-known uh, college here in the Hampton Roads area. Any comments or questions from the group? Anyone? Okay. I, I'm so used to having a, pro I forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot, I didn't interrupt you and I forgot to ask beforehand because normally people have presentations and I got to make sure they're set up, you know, to do the PowerPoint. But, uh, but no, that was fine. I really enjoyed that. Um, I hadn't heard much about black Judaism before. So his church, they taught both Jewish teachings and Christian teachings together. Yeah, they're, they're a blend of that. Uh, there again, there are different uh, uh, Black Jewish groups. Uh, mm -hmm. Now they don't. I don't think any of the ones in America have any direct links to the Falashas. You know, those were Ethiopian Jews who converted centuries right. ago. Uh, there was one, uh, it was in Philadelphia during the 1940s. An interesting book was published at that time, Black Gods of the Metropolis, Negro Religious Cults in the Urban North. It has a chapter on the Church of God, uh, uh, well, the Church of the Living God, uh, headed by Bishop Frank Cherry, uh, a totally different type of man than the one we're talking about Uh this was a black nationalist group that uh, was extremely anti-white, and they claimed that the original Jews were black and the current day Jews are imposters. And uh, he, uh, uh, Prophet Cherry, claimed to God had given him the exclusive right to use profanity, and he often cursed from the pulpit, and uh, that was acceptable. Oh, wow. And anyway, uh, but they, uh, Bishop uh, Plummer's group doesn't 
have the same racist uh, uh, philosophy and teaching that uh, uh, Prophet Cherry's group has. And there, again, there are some, uh, most of them, and well, if they're, if they're Jewish, considered Jewish, they're going to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath uh, and usually the Jewish feast days as well. And it, uh, I know that there are some black Jews from America that have tried to settle in Israel and they were saying, no, you're really not Jews. And uh, they, the question yeah. was, was this racist or, or was it because they, they didn't give any claim to, uh, tr truthful evidence. I mean, the, some of the falashas have been accepted in Israel, but uh, that book, Black Gods in Metropolis, it was written in the 40s by Arthur Hope Fawcett. It's a good book. I originally got a copy of it because I was studying the, I was writing an article about the Moorish Science Temple, which is uh, the first is black Islamic organization in America. I've written several articles about it and my master's thesis at Baylor many years ago was on the nation of Islam and the, um, the nation of Islam, black Muslims are an offshoot of the Moorish Science Temple. The Moors still exist, but they're not as well known. But their founder was mm -hmm. Timothy Drew, who took the name Noble Drew Ali. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out where he got the name Noble from. Uh, there was a great deal of Freemasonry enshrined them in the Morris Science Temple. The other, uh, let's see, there, in that book, there's a chapter on the Moors, chapter on Father Divine, chapter on Sweet Daddy Grace, chapter on the Black Jews, and another uh, group, the Mount Sinai Holy Church. So, uh, interesting. <laughs> I'm sorry. I bet you're wrapping up to a point. <laughs> it's like, and period. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> well, that was very, and the, the Prince Hall, we had, uh, it's, it's very, and I guess uh, it's hard for people like Brian, I guess, to relate since it's pretty much an American thing here with the uh, the Prince Hall. But um, in Virginia, I think it was 90, it was around 2000 when we finally recognized our Prince Hall counterparts. And w do you recall when it was in Texas that you all did? Uh, it came in phases. The first, uh, it was okay. in December, December 2006 was what I call simple recognition. Okay. No inner visitation was allowed. Then in 2014, right. they allowed inner visitation with the approval of both grand secretaries. Uh, and then in January 2017, it was opened up uh, to inner visitation where it would be determined by the local lodge. And so okay. it, uh, it took a long time. And I know, well, I think Virginia, when they've, if I'm not mistaken, Virginia first just had simple recognition, then later allowed inter visitation. Uh, yes, that, you had to basically you had to kind of coordinate through the Grand Lodge because yeah. it was um, I, I want to say 20, 2008, 2010, somewhere around then. Virginia Research Lodge. If if Keith was here, he'd be able to tell you uh, our, our our former secretary. But I attended one of our meetings where we had about 20 members of Prince Hall lodges attended. And the, I think he was the grand secretary at the time, former past grand master of Prince Hall grand lodge. Um, he was our guest speaker and it was very interesting. So we're all sitting there. Um, it wasn't so much his talk that I remember, but it was afterwards the master opened it up to the floor and said, y'all, anyone just want to ask questions from the sidelines? And one of them, one of the uh, Prince Hall brothers got up and said, yeah, I'd, I just have to say it's more of a comment than a question. It's like, look at y'all, because <laughs> they're all in black suits, white shirt, black ties, very formal dress, no lapel pins, no nothing. And every Mason in there, any American Mason knows uh, we're all in blazers. One or two might be in a suit. Most of us are like, you know, sport coat and jack, sport coat and pants different color ties, very brightly colored sport coats, all sort of Masonic pins and whatever, just kind of outlandish compared to them. And they say, is this typical of what you wear to your meetings? And we say, yeah, well, yes, other than previous... tuxedos at the stadiums, you know, we dress like this. <laughs> well, 
I, it reminds me when I was uh, pastor in Kaufman, Texas, in the eighties. One of my members, I had there was a Masonic Prince uh, Hall celebration. That I, I'm not, I don't remember which one it was. There was actually three of them during the year: uh, Palm Sunday in the spring, St. John's Day in June, and Prince Hall Day in September. And Brother Scott uh, wanted to go. He was a worshipful master, but he didn't have anything to wear. And I said, well, you wear what you got on. And like it was a blue suit or something, I didn't realize, hey, that's not the way we dress at a, at a service like that. Um, Brother Scott passed yeah. in 2000. His wife passed in 2020. And we maintained contact with the, the community and the family. And it was in... Uh, January 2020 at his mother's uh, service, Raymond, the youngest son, who's keeping the lodge going, his worshipful master, and he's acting with the Herons of Jericho as his, his sister. I got up and made my remarks and said, Raymond, Raymond I, keep, I want to commend you for keeping the lodge going. Your daddy would be proud. And it, uh, I, I can, there are two Virginia Masons that worked hard for Prince Hall recognition but did not live to see it. One was Alan E. Roberts, and the other was yes. past past Grandmaster Cabell Cobbs. Yes, he he was ma he was actually master of Virginia Research Lodge the year that I joined. Uh, yeah, Roberts. Cabell Cobbs was um, very much in favor of recognition. He actually um, what I what he stands out now. You can say most grandmasters don't leave a mark. I mean, their grandmaster, they may have a program and you forget him in two or three years. Everybody's going to always remember Cabell Cobbs because the year he was master. Um, and at this time, now setting aside the recognition of Prince Hall, which is predominantly black, of course, and uh, Grand Lodge, Virginia, predominantly white, obviously. Um, it was pretty much uh, segregated. There were not a lot of black men joining Virginia lodges. It just, we just weren't. We, if someone came across someone who wanted to join, we'd, we'd send them off to Prince Hall to join. And this one fellow was an army, I think he was an army colonel, black man, um, church deacon, outstanding member of the community. It was like Northern Virginia, Alexandria or whatever. And he had petitioned a lodge in, in uh, Northern Virginia, though. I think it was in Alexandria. And he got blackballed. And somehow word got out that, you know, we're not going to have any black men in this lodge. So the Grand Master showed up at another meeting and declared they were going to ballot again. And they balloted and it came up. He was blackballed. And he said, is there anyone here who has any good cause why this petitioner should not be made a Mason? Any moral reason, anything about him that he, that he would be unqualified to join as a Mason, knowing that he was only being blackballed because he was black. And no one, of course, said anything. So he just destroyed the ballot and said, well, I declare him elected. Boom. So the first <laughs> I heard black man to join. <laughs> uh, Brother, Cobb, Brother Cobb sent me a letter and he explained some of that. He, he was a great guy. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, I was, it was two years ago. I, got a, I was gassing up the service station and got a call from uh, my friend Al Roundtree in Washington, D.C., uh, who uh, was uh, his editor of the Philaxis magazine and asked me to do a, uh, an article about John Lewis, the congressman from Georgia, and it was 33rd degree. And I did, and it was, uh, I, I watched on television and well, YouTube and a funeral of John Lewis, and I gathered information about his Masonic record, his 33rd degree, his shrine and everything. And thing was he would that man was so awesome because he spent so much of his life trying to bring people together and i don't know if you uh, saw a video of his his masonic funeral the prince hall masons of georgia along with some from tennessee were joined by three the grand master i think two of his offices from the grand lodge of georgia and uh they were not in fraternal relations yet but here, this man is bringing people together in death. The following year, yep. Georgia <laughs> voted to recognize uh, Prince Hall, as did Tennessee. It's my understanding there's only five holdouts now. I think it's four now. There, there's four holdouts. There are four Tell, who, Grand Lodges. Who, 
Who know. came around? I don't recall. <laughs> well, I got to know here? this because I know that. Okay. I know that. Uh, I thought it was Tennessee made it four. No, I it thought. makes it five. Um, the, the, the la- okay. and less, less my information is dated. There's, there's five that are still holding out now. Arkansas is very resistant. Mississippi has voted it down, I think, more than once. Louisiana's got a special set of problems there. And uh, South Carolina, they might be get. I think they're getting close. And, and up in your area, West Virginia, I've not actually been to West Virginia, but I'm told that that hillbilly culture is very strong there. <laughs> I think it, West Virginia... I thought West Virginia did already, but maybe not. if they um, did, that that'd be great. I I haven't heard other. I, I haven't heard that. I just I hear it. I, I heard something on Facebook. I'd have to go dig for it. Um, I'm sure I can find a list somewhere of them. But yeah, we have made progress. But for those who don't pay close attention, I don't know. <laughs> um, because of the system of recognition, and of course, we have 51. Uh, Grand Lodges in America that are mainstream or state or whatever you want to call us. And then there are about 30 some Prince Hall Grand Lodges that came up alongside once Prince Hall masonry became a thing. Um, and over time, virtually every Grand Lodge in America, every state Grand Lodge recognizes each other. And it's only been literally in the last 20 years in Virginia, I think it was one of the earliest actually, but it's only been the last 25 years, top six, maybe Oklahoma was one of the first, that, uh, say, Virginia would recognize the Prince Hall, Grand Lodge of Virginia, and so forth. Now, that still leaves, like, for example, Virginia recognizes Texas. Virginia recognizes Prince Hall of Virginia. Texas recognizes Prince Hall of Texas. Virginia probably doesn't recognize Prince Hall of Texas. So we're like one removed. So I could go to a lodge in Texas, sitting in a lodge with you, Bob, and there could be a Prince Hall brother from Texas sitting there, and he could be sitting in a lodge, but I couldn't go with him to his lodge and attend because we don't recognize each other. I think over time, all of the Grand Lodges, I think, just takes momentum for people to say, well, we recognize North Carolina, we recognize Prince Hall, North Carolina, why don't we go and recognize Prince Hall, you know, and fill those gaps, and eventually all of the Grand Lodges in America will recognize each other. Well, North that Carolina will come about at some point. North mm-hmm. Carolina had quite a struggle, and they, they were getting a lot. Of, they it took them several years to finally uh, get it accomplished, but they did. And uh, mm-hmm. I know I know one North Carolina Masonic leader that was very strong in support of that was past Grand Master William Brunk. Do you know who I'm talking mm-hmm. about? I met him. I, I don't. I don't follow North Carolina much. Okay, I, I met him. He spoke at a meeting I attended in Dallas, and later I was in Washington okay. D.C. for a second time in twenty two thousand three. I was in I was inducted in the Society of Blue Friars. In fact, I was oh, my. Yep. Des, designated as Blue, Blue Friar number ninety two. And uh, uh, but Bill Bill Brunk, he's a he's an orthodontist by profession in in Raleigh. And he was, I know that when it, he was grandmaster, he held some meetings with uh, uh, the Prince Hall grandmaster at the time, William Parker, and they got along real good. And it, um, it's been a step-by-step process. I heard a story, well, this is way out the other end of the country. In California, there was uh, a black man who was, Worshipful master of one of the most prestigious lodges the Grand Lodge of California has. And he stood up in Grand Lodge and asked the brethren, how many of you have sons who are Masons? Quite a few hands went up. Then how many of you have sons you wish were Masons? Quite a few more hands went up. Then he said, my father was so proud when I became a Mason. Now, my dad passed away last year. We never sat in lodge together because he was a Prince Hall Mason. Silence. Oh, wow. <laughs> and they, it was right after that they voted to recognize Prince Hall. But I can oh, imagine my. that was something that they, they really felt 
missed out on that his he and his dad could never sit in the lodge together. Jeez. Well, it, it's something. It, it's I hear a lot of chatter. Of course, I follow a lot of things on Facebook, and there's a lot of discussions here, there, and everywhere. And it just it's one of those things that our detractors will constantly point out. Well, masonry is segregated. Masonry is like you have to sit down and explain how the recognition system works before you get to the part explaining why there's a Prince Hall and why we don't recognize each other. Because the short answer is, well, we do recognize, but not everywhere. And it's sort of a con it's, it's complicated, but it sounds like you're making excuses, but it's like, well, look, here's how it works <laughs> because there is yeah, not well, one body. Like if there was one body of masonry in America or in the world, we could just say, okay, we recognize you when we're done. But because we're all independent and sovereign, we can sit here in Virginia all day long and say, I hope that Mississippi recognizes Prince Hall of Mississippi. We have no control over that. That's and true. So it's sort of like we're waiting for everyone to catch up and you're not going to get, you're not going to get momentum rolling to say, okay, Mississippi, either you recognize Prince Hall or we're going to no longer recognize you. But that's about the only weight we have. But it's just one of those things where I've seen it in my time as a Mason where things have changed dramatically. There are a number of darker skinned or better tanned brothers in my lodge, as I like to put it, who came to us mostly from, um, from clandestine bodies because there's a huge clandestine Masonic uh, presence in Virginia has to do with the Navy, I guess, and a lot of people from out of state. But quite a few brothers, didn't, they found out they were in a clandestine lodge, didn't want to join Prince Hall, and join one of our lodges. And Ocean View is one of the ones, my mother lodge, is, is very welcoming. And we have at least half a dozen now. And so I get to hear more from them, the perspective of what it's like to be clandestine and all that. And also in this area, I want to say there are a couple brothers who joined Norfolk number one, which is one of the oldest lodges in the state. And it's in my district. They have actively sought out the Prince Hall uh, Lodge in Virginia Beach near Oceana, I can't think of the name of it, and they've attended. We now have the ability to just go and attend, and they've made an act, because I've said for years, like, what's the point of recognizing each other if you never see each other in lodge? And they're actively, I've been to several, I've been to a table lodge at Granby Street, which is where our big temple is, where all, most of the lodges meet, and there were several Prince Hall brothers present for this table lodge. And I know that they're going back and forth, and the officers in both of these lodges are actively working to interact more frequently. So we are making strides uh, in well, here in Virginia to bring us all closer together. Well, to, Masonic racism is not a thing of the past totally, but it's, it's not as mm -hmm. bad as it used to be. I, I, uh, t today, uh, my home lodge, Waco 92, is having installation of officers. I'm not going to be able to attend because I have a mandatory church meeting to attend. Uh, at that uh, same same time in Temple. But uh, I'm thankful to say I'm welcome there today with open arms. By the way, uh, August 21st will mark 50 years since my A degree. But there was a time, there was a time in my, my home lodge, I was a person non grata. They didn't want anything to do with me. And I'll tell you why. Can you see this? Yes, we can. <laughs> My wife, Deborah, and I, well, we've been married 45 years, and uh, and they didn't want anything to do with me because I married a black woman. That's changed. Uh, Virginia is yeah, also yeah. the case where those laws, the state where those laws changed. Are you familiar with Loving versus Virginia? Yes. There's a movie, Loving, is a very good movie. By the way, I talked on the phone several times with Mildred before she died. The real Mildred Loving. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Anyway, unfortunately, I, I was Googling a few years back. I found an obituary for the notorious uh, sheriff, uh, uh, Garnett Brooks, who arrested Richard and Mildred in bed. Uh Who's this woman you're sleeping with, son? I'm his wife. Not in Virginia, you're not. Well, anyway, hmm. Garnett Brooks, unfortunately, was a Mason, according to his his, his oh, obituary. 
he was in Car Carolyn County is uh, in the Tidewater area. I have not been there. Yep. A place called Central Point is where they lived. And, and, you know, they won their case in the U.S. Supreme Court June 12th, 1967. And by the way, uh, our son was born on June 12th, 1981. And he, he hmm. was very well aware of the fact that he was born on a loving day. We didn't intend it that way. This is just how it happened. But anyway, um, the, um, um, they, what happened though, uh, they moved back to Central Point. Richard built a house and they were hit by a drunk driver in 1975. Richard was killed instantly. And Mildred never remarried. She lived in that house that Richard built for her until her death from pneumonia in 2008. I'm, I'm, in, a, I'm, I'm in a book club in Wisconsin. I'm in a Masonic book club in Wisconsin. And one of our members was a, a past grandmaster of Prince Hall. And he suggested a book we read uh, uh, by a past grandmaster. I believe the name was Buta, and it was Black Black Freemasonry, White America. And it went through uh, in quite a bit of detail uh, the first recognition that was given, and I believe it was Connecticut was the first Grand Lodge to in recognize recent years, Prince Hall. Nineteen eighty-nine. That's correct. Right. However, yeah. there were there were two previous attempts. Washington State in 1898 yes. under past Grand Master William H. Upton, he decreed that no Masonic monument be erected above his grave until his brothers and Prince Hall could, could join hands and call each other brothers. That happened in 1990 when Washington State recognized Prince Hall, same, t same year Wisconsin did. Right. And then uh, 19... Uh, 47, the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts attempted recognition. Both times, other Grand Lodges threatened to cut fraternal relations if they didn't rescind, and so they bowed to pressure. And I think there was some effort like that in 89 with uh, the uh, Grand Lodge of uh, Connecticut, but uh, they they stood. They didn't, didn't back down. I think Connecticut was first, Nebraska was second. Washington and Wisconsin were about the same time. And then right. I believe in 91, Colorado became the fifth. And it's been a domino effect ever since. And uh, I hope what you're saying, Brother Douglas, is correct. It's down to four. I, I, I think there's somewhat of a friendly climate in South Carolina. And I was predicting South Carolina might be the next. And I hope before I die, they all fall in line. But we'll just got to wait and see. It, uh, but it, it's interesting to see how it evolves. Like you said, Washington State tried to recognize Prince Hall and all the other Grand Lodges pressured them to not recognize them and they would cut off fraternal relations if they didn't. And now we're at a point today where I just suggested casually, though, but maybe it's time for the Grand Lodges to put pressure on the remaining ones to say, we're going to cut off ties if you don't recognize them. So. I would love to see what a that. difference 120 years can make. <laughs> it sure can. I think it would take great courage on the part of a grandmaster to to bring that about. But I, I think I'm going to have to plan. Maybe we should have another have one of our topics in the future be like Prince Hall and recognition and, and kind of delve into the history. Because, like I said, I I only know broad things off the top of my head, and then you're like rattling off specific gates. <laughs> You've got the actual specifics. I just know. In broad terms, I don't have the dates and, and everything in front of it me, was, so I appreciate that, you being better informed than I am on the in, topic. The, in the beginning, uh, about, uh, now, do you know where Pulaski is? I know Roanoke, yes. I have a rough idea, yes. Okay, well, it's the other side. Uh, it's Pulaski, Withville, Blacksburg, mm -hmm. Christiansburg, all these are in the yep. same area. Our sales meetings right. were held on Sundays, and sometimes in Lynchburg and sometimes in Roanoke. But uh, I really hope and pray I'll be able to make it back up to Pulaski next year because that is just uh, one awesome community. And it would like to be a 50-year uh, visit. And the, But I a lot of things were changing back then. Set, uh, uh, 
I had just I had just graduated from Baylor the first time with my BA degree. I had just turned 22. This was in 1973, and a lot of things were going on with Watergate and with uh, Vietnam and all kinds of stuff in in America in the news. Uh, but uh, you know, we had made some progress about civil rights. I remember sitting in a black uh, home in Pulaski and waiting to see somebody there was a copy of jet magazine on the coffee table and i started looking through there and i had a later we uh, went back and got this article and put it on file there was a man named hobson r reynolds who was the grand no the they call it the uh uh grand yeah grand exalted ruler of the improved benevolent protective order of elks that's the black elks organization and uh, the IBP, the, the BPOE, the older group, the Benevolent Protective Order of Elks, at the 1972 convention in Atlantic City had voted against uh, dropping their all-white membership requirement. But hmm. the next year in Chicago, in summer 73, they voted to drop it, but it had to be approved by each local lodge and uh, uh Reynolds uh, side of the trick there. But these fraternal organizations have played important roles in the African-American community. It was in the early 70s that the uh, animal lodges, the elks, moose, and eagles, dropped their whites only uh, clause. Was that, I, I gotta ask, so there was literally something in writing in their bylaws that says you have to be white to join the elks? I have Hey, I'm sorry. Yeah, Willie, are you talking to us, Willie? Anyway, yeah, that was the case. I'm mute him. Well, in, the <laughs> in the history of the Supreme Council by, uh, uh, I think William Fox is the author, of the History of the Southern Jurisdiction, It uh, he says that the southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite never had any racially restricted membership requirements, but some of the Grand Lodges from which they drew their membership did. Uh, the, and by the way, when the Animal Lodges changed their policies, it wasn't for the most worthy reasons. Uh, all over the country, they were losing their liquor licenses because many ah. communities <laughs> wouldn't grant a liquor license to a private club that practice of discrimination. So if you want to bring the social change, threaten to cut off the booze. And anyway, there you go. It, uh, well, I, I wish our lodges let us serve booze, but we don't. So maybe that would be a way to bring them about. <laughs> well, hey, and, uh, and there's some, there's been some uh, problems with the shrine in Arkansas, I understand. Mm -hmm. And that had yeah. to do with some liquor license that a uh, Somebody held, and uh, I don't know if that's been resolved or not, but the Grand Lodge of Arkansas withdrew recognition for the shrine. And many, sh many that, Arkansas. That, that, uh, that? I, don't, I, I, I didn't hear anything about a liquor license, but I do know Arkansas, there was two states, I think it might have been Michigan or Wisconsin. Uh, I think Chris Hodap, on his, uh, the, the guy who wrote the Masonry for Dummies books, um, he has a good blog and he always seems to cover the, the real controversy, the stuff we probably shouldn't talk about in public kind of thing. But yeah. my understanding in Arkansas was, so this fellow was the potentate of a local shrine and he was a member of, of course, the, a lodge in, in Arkansas. He was arrested or charged with some felony. He either pled guilty or was convicted of a felony in the state. The Grand Lodge suspended him from membership the shrine told him never mind you're still head of the you're still potentate you're still run the shrine and the grand lodge got wind of it and the grand master said well hold on you're a mason first you have to be a mason to be a shriner if we suspend you for your felony you don't get to be a shriner you have to be suspended as well and the potentate the the, the shrine in essence said well no piss on y'all he's you know, you, you can kick him out of Blue Lodge, but we, you can't do anything about him being trained. He's our potentate. So the Grand Master had to go take the extreme step of saying, okay, anyone who is a, sh until this is resolved, any Mason who 
attends or it, it show, does anything involving the shrine in Arkansas, I'm going to suspend all of you. So it was basically a, a, a pissing contest between the two. I think the Grand Lodge eventually won out and the guy was suspended from the shrine. But it was just, it was, it seemed like it was one of those things where, you know, there were no grown-ups in the room to say, can we just settle this somehow? But it would seem to be uh, like a, I don't know, it was a pissing contest between the Grand Master and the shrine. But from the details I read, the Grand Master was in the right in that you're a Mason first. And if you're suspended from Masonry, you can't be in a, another body that requires Masonic membership. But and I think, uh, it's kind of uh, like he was wielding a big stick to uh, to say, well, all you Shriners are going to be kicked out of Masonry if you don't, you know, if you, if, if you, until they fix this. So I don't know. I think some it it just seemed like a lot of bad stuff. I think Arkansas Shriners, some of them move their membership to other states. Yes, so they could still be in the shrine, yes. Yeah, and it, uh, uh, I had uh, with the, um, well, you mentioned Chris Hodap. I've talked to him on the phone before, and we, I've read quite a bit of his stuff. He wrote one of his books is The Secret uh, of the Law Symbol. And mm -hmm. yeah. in his uh, bibliography, he cites one of my books, Eliphas Levy and the Kabbalah, oh. The Masonic and French Connection mm -hmm. of the American Mystery Tradition. Uh, I've written four books, and Eliphas Levy and the Kabbalah is, was my doctoral dissertation at Baylor that I finished in 1995. And uh, uh, Eliphas Levy was the, the, the pen name of a French Roman Catholic who took, he wrote about the Kabbalah and other esoteric traditions. He was not actually Jewish, but there's plenty of evidence that Albert Pike plagiarized a great deal of history and ma of magic and dogma and ritual of the high magic of Eliphas Levy and writing morals and dogma. Now I've, I've read morals and dogma from cover to cover. And by the way, my first copy of morals and dogma was given to me by a Virginia Mason during the summer I was in Pulaski. And I still have, I've read that book cover to cover and I have on my coffee wow. table, Art De Hoy's annotated edition. I haven't finished. I've read, uh, I'm, I'm working on it. I've read like 200 some odd pages yeah. a bit long and I was at, through Rex Hutchins writings, I was able to cross reference passages that Pike borrowed from Levy. And, uh, but both of them were very interesting men. I, Albert Pike was a product of his time. And, uh, yeah. I was totally appalled, uh, two years ago on the 19th of June when his, the vandals took his statue down in Washington, DC. It, uh, Explain that more. On um, you said in morals and dogma, he actually took stuff from from magic type. Uh, yeah, his two books, Balfour's Levy, Dogma and Ritual of the High Magic, and uh, History of Magic. Uh, you can you can put the fat books side by side and see it's almost verbatim. It's not just with that, but with Buku's stuff. Uh, yeah, was, Albert Pike, um, Morals and Dogma was written by a number of people. Albert Pike put it all together. He did not give proper attribution. He, he gave attribution here and there, but I'm given to understand he, he took whole passages from other books and put it in as his words and didn't make it clear that this was written by so and so. And I took it. He just basically plagiarized it a lot of a lot of it. He put okay. it all together, but he didn't give proper attribution. My friend, uh, I'm, I'm just yeah. surprised by the magic type. You know, and, I mean, is a lot of this stuff considered some kind of magic? Or? Um, Eliphas Levy was was not much in practical magic at all. He was uh, on, more on the theoretical side. There were some others who took their keys from him. In my book, I deal with his. In, I have a whole chapter to the Pike, but he also influenced. Other people like in, in the Rosicrucianism, the, the Theosophical Society, Anthroposophical Society, Builders of the Additum, and other uh, movements that bear the imprint of Elvis Levy. But he himself did, was not a literal magician in the sense of practicing stuff. Uh, you know, there's Aleister Crowley, who 
was born in 1875, a few months after Ale Eliphas Levy's death, claimed to be Eliphas Levy reincarnated. Uh, he had some very bad stuff, and I have tremendous respect for Eliphas Levy, very little respect for Alistair Crowley. He was with the mm. Order of the Temple of the or Orient, OTO, and there's so many interesting groups out there. A lot of them do have some kind of Masonic influence. Uh, I've never been a well, roaster. Hmm. I've never I wanted been, to uh, go ahead. Go ahead, finish it, Bob. I'm sorry. I've never been a Rosicrucian. I've known a few people that have. Uh, I know in Dallas, near the SMU campus on Insurance Lane, they have a, a lodge. I've been by there before. But as my understanding, most of their they have some lodges in which people actually participate. Most of their members are male. Oil. As long as you send them money, hmm. they'll lessons to study and I, that's i've been learning i've been learning more and more about the rosicrucians and and some people claim that uh they're one guy tells me they're that all the rosicrucians meet in masonic lodges and vice versa and i said well no that's that's not true uh, <laughs> i've never met a rosicrucian who was a mason not in in person and i don't know of any locally but there there are some ties and there's some people that speculate our origins that we drew from the Rosicrucian. So I wanted to get somebody on here as this one of my future talks is having someone come on and talk about Rosicrucianism and kind of explain it and kind of tie it to Masonry to uh, give us more of um, you know, some yeah, background. But I wanted to, we're kind of, I, I, we're kind of wandering into different topics. So I, I, I want to kind of try and wrap it up if we don't have any more specific questions about your paper, if that's all right. Um, but I do want to mention our upcoming meeting, which will be July 23rd, which will be uh, Brother Ben Zion, uh, who is the author of the book, Whence Came You? And his topic is Finding Perfection Through Self-Inquiry. So that would be interesting. We're going to get into back into some more esoteric stuff. Um, we do we'll cover a lot of things here. And uh, Bob, I really appreciate this is more of a historical paper and gave us more of a background on Prince Hall masonry and, and, and a very active uh, Mason. Uh, we do a lot of esoteric stuff, a lot of kind of more obscure stuff, and that's a lot of fun. So I'm trying to find a lot of different things out there to, to bring in here and, and expose to us all and bring out some good discussions. Um, but does anybody else have any more comments specific to the paper? Because we could talk for hours on all the things y'all are bringing up as kind of side things. I want to kind of try and keep us on track here. <laughs> so any other comments for Bob's uh, paper or um, Brother Plummer in particular? Going on. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again, Bob. <laughs> I do appreciate it. Um, yeah, I don't want to just have an open-ended discussion. I kind of want to might maybe keep us on track. We this is actually one of our shorter meetings. We've gone on for like two hours before, so oh wow! Well, you know, you're talking a lot about uh, um, masonry uh, and other organizations. Well, you know who Jay yeah. Kenny is, the author of the Masonic Myth. I met him at that yeah. meeting in D.C. and he lives in San Francisco. Uh, in his book, he describes an experience out in California. He was at a, a watering hole, and there was an old Italian man, apparently saw his ring, and he said, you, Mason, me, mafiosi, same thing. No, they're not. Yes, you, Mason, me, mafiosi, same thing. <laughs> and I'm sure there are people who think that way. <laughs> wow. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, good. We could go further, but uh, uh, yeah, so I appreciate everyone coming out today. I'm sorry it's kind of a light crowd here, Bob, but uh, I did enjoy your talk. And I hope people, if you're watching this on YouTube, this will be up on YouTube uh, hopefully within a week. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube and you're still with us, please like and subscribe. We always want more subscribers to our channel. And I want to thank everyone for coming out today. Any uh, closing comments from anybody before we close? All right. Uh